learning objectives in this chapter the user will learn the following in detail information theoretic argument adversary argument p and np np completeness and reduction primality tests quadratic residues applications to cryptography lower bound theory and information theoretic bounds adversary argument adversary argument is a method of proving a lower bound by playing role of adversary that makes algorithm work the hardest by adjusting input example guessing a number between 1 and n with yes or no questions adversary puts the number in a larger of the two subsets generated by last question what is an adversary it is an algorithm which intercepts access to data structures constructs the input data only as needed attempts to make original algorithm work as hard as possible analyze adversary to obtain lower bound important restriction although data is created dynamically it must return consistent results if it replies that x of 1 is less than x of 2 it can never say later that x of 2 is less than x of 1 max and min keep values and status quotes for all keys quotes n represents never used w represents one once but never lost l represents lost once but never won wl represents one and lost at least once key values will be arranged to make answers to come out right accumulating information 2n 2 bits of information are required to solve the problem all keys except one must lose all keys except one must win comparing n n pairs gives n by 2 comparisons and n bits of information n minus 2 additional bits are required one comparison each is needed results 3 n by 2 minus 2 comparisons are needed this is a lower bound upper bound is given by the following compare elements pairwise but losers in one pile winners in another pile find max of winners min of losers this gives 3 n by 2 minus 2 comparisons the algorithm is optimal largest and second largest second largest must have lost to largest second largest is max of those compared to largest tournament method gives n minus 1 plus log n comparisons for finding largest and second largest second largest adversary all keys are assigned weights w of i weights are all initialized to 1 adversary replies are based on weights accumulation of weight solution of the problem requires all weight to be accumulated with one key all other keys must have weight 0 since weight accumulates to highest weight weight can at most double with each comparison log n comparisons are required to accumulate all weight results the largest key must be compared with log n other keys finding the second largest requires at least log in comparisons after finding the largest this is a lower bound the tournament algorithm is optimal applications to cryptography cryptographic computations the internet is enabling a growing number of activities such as correspondence example email shopping example web stores and financial transactions example online banking to be performed electronically however the internet itself is an insecure transmission network data transmitted over the internet travels through several intermediate specialized computers called routers which can observe the data and potentially modify it a variety of cryptographic techniques have been developed to support secure communication over an insecure network such as the internet cryptography research has developed the following useful cryptographic computations 
encryption and decryption. A message M to be transmitted called the plain text is transformed into an unrecognizable string of characters C called the cipher text before being sent over the network. This transformation is known as encryption. After the cipher text C is received, it is converted back to the plain text M using an inverse transformation that depends on additional secret information. This reverse transformation is called decryption. An essential ingredient in encryption is that it should be computationally infeasible for an outsider to transform C back to M without knowing the secret information possessed by the receiver. Digital Signatures The author of a message M computes a message S that is derived from M and a secret information known by the author. The message S is a digital signature if another party can easily verify that only the author of M would have computed S in a reasonable amount of time. Using Cryptographic Computations for Information Security Services Data Integrity Computing a digital signature S of a message M not only help us to determine the author of M, it also verifies the integrity of M. For a modification to M would produce a different signature. So, to perform a data integrity check, we can perform a verification test that S is, in fact, a digital signature for the message M. Authentication The above cryptographic tools can be used for authentication in two possible ways. In password authentication schemes, a user will type a user ID and password in a client application. With this combination being immediately encrypted and sent to an authenticator. If the encrypted user ID and password combination matches that in a user database, then the individual is authenticated and the database never stores passwords in plain text. Alternatively, an authenticator can issue a challenge to a user in the form of a random message M that the user must immediately digitally sign for authentication. Authorization Given a scheme for authentication, we can issue authorizations by keeping lists called access control lists that are associated with sensitive data or computations that should be accessed only by authorized individuals. Alternatively, the holder of a right to sensitive data or computations can digitally sign a message C that authorizes a user to perform certain tasks. For example, the message would be of the form I, US Corporation Vice President, give person X permission to access our fourth quarter earnings data. Confidentiality Sensitive information can be kept secret from non-authorized agents by encrypting it. Non-repudiation If we make the parties negotiating a contract, M, digitally sign that message, then we can have a way of proving that they have seen and agreed to the content of the message M. This section gives an introduction to cryptographic computations. Conventional names of persona such as Alice, Bob and A.V. are used to denote the parties involved in a cryptographic protocol. Symmetric encryption schemes A fundamental problem in cryptography is confidentiality that is sending a message from Alice to Bob so that a third party A.V cannot gain any information from an intercepted copy of the message. Moreover, we have observed that confidentiality can be achieved by encryption schemes or ciphers, where the message M to be transmitted, called the plain text, is encrypted into an unrecognizable string of characters C called the cipher text before being sent over the network. After the cipher text C is received, it is decrypted back to the plain text M using an inverse transformation called decryption. Secret Keys 
in describing the details of an encryption scheme we must explain all the steps needed in order to encrypt a plain text m into a cipher text c and how to then decrypt that cipher text c back to m moreover in order for av to be unable to extract m from c there must be some secret information that is kept private from her in traditional cryptography a common secret key k is shared by alice and bob and is used to both encrypt and decrypt the message such schemes are also called symmetric encryption schemes since k is used for both encryption and decryption and the same secret is shared by both alice and bob substitution ciphers a classic example of a symmetric cipher is a substitution cipher where the secret key is a permutation pi of the characters of the alphabet encrypting plain text m into cipher text c consists of replacing each character x of m with character y equals pi of x decryption can be easily performed by knowing the permutation function pi indeed m is derived from c by replacing each character y of c with character x equals pi minus 1 into y the caesar cipher is an early example of a substitution cipher where each character x is replaced by character y equals x plus k mod n where n is the size of the alphabet and k lies between 1 and n is the secret key this substitution scheme is known as the caesar cipher for julius caesar is known to have used it with k equals 3 substitution ciphers are quite easy to use but they are not secure indeed the secret key can be quickly inferred using frequency analysis based on the knowledge of the frequency of the various letters or groups of consecutive letters in the text language the one time pad secure symmetric ciphers exist indeed the most secure cipher known is a symmetric cipher it is the one time pad in this crypto system alice and bob each share a random bit string k as large as any message they might wish to communicate the string k is the symmetric key for to compute a cipher text c from a message m alice computes c equals m circle plus k where circle plus denotes the bitwise exclusive or or xor operator she can send c to bob using any reliable communication channel even one on which av is eavesdropping because the cipher text to c is computationally indistinguishable from a random string nevertheless bob can easily decrypt the cipher text message c by computing c circle plus k since C circle plus K produce M, where zero denotes the bit string of all zeros the same length as M. This scheme is clearly a symmetric cipher system since the key K is used for encryption and decryption. The one-time pad is computationally efficient for bitwise exclusive R is one of the fastest operators that computers can perform. Also as already mentioned the one time pad is incredibly secure nevertheless the one time pad crypto system is not widely used the main trouble with this system is that alice and bob must share a very large secret key moreover the security of the one time pad depends crucially on the fact that the secret key k is used only once if k is reused There are several simple crypto analyses that can break this system. For practical crypto systems, we prefer secret keys that can be reused and are smaller than the messages they encrypt and decrypt. Other symmetric ciphers. Secure and efficient symmetric ciphers do exist. They are referred to by their acronyms or colorful names such as triple dash 
IDEA, Blowfish and Rindall. They perform a sequence of complex substitution and permutation transformations on the bits of the plain text. While these systems are important in many applications, they are only mildly interesting from an algorithmic viewpoint. They run in time proportional to the length of the message being encrypted or decrypted. Public Key Crypto Systems A major problem with symmetric ciphers is key transfer or how to distribute the secret key for encryption and decryption. In 1976, Diffie and Hellman described an abstract system that would avoid these problems, the public key crypto system. While they didn't actually publish a particular public key system, they discussed the features of such a system. Specifically, given a message M, encryption function E and decryption function D, the following four properties must hold. Property 1, D of E of M equals M. Property 2, both E and D are easy to compute. Property 3, it is computationally infeasible to derive D from E. Property 4, E of D of M equals M. The first property states that once a message has been encrypted, applying the decryption procedure will restore it. Property 2 is perhaps more obvious. In order for a crypto system to be practical, encryption and decryption must be computationally fast. The third property is the start of the innovation. It means that E only goes one way. It is computationally infeasible to invert E unless you already know D. Thus, the encryption procedure E can be made public. Any party can send a message while one knows how to decrypt it. If the fourth property holds, then the mapping is one to one. Thus, the crypto system is a solution to the digital signature problem. Given an electronic message from Bob to Alice, how can we prove that Bob actually sent it? Bob can apply his decryption procedure to some signature message M. Any other party can then verify that Bob actually sent the message by applying the public encryption procedure E. Since only Bob knows the decryption function, only Bob can generate a signature message which can be correctly decoded by the function E. Public key cryptography is the basis of modern cryptography. Its economic importance is fast growing. Since it provides the security infrastructure of all electronic transactions over the internet. The design of public key crypto systems can be described in general terms. The idea is to find a very tough problem in computer science and then somehow tie the crypto system to it. Ideally, one arrives at an actual proof that breaking the crypto system is computationally equivalent to solving the difficult problem. There is a large class of problems called NP-complete, which do not have known polynomial time algorithms for their solution. In fact, it is widely believed that there are none. Then, to generate the particular encryption and decryption keys, we create a particular set of parameters for this problem. Encrypting then means turning the message into an instance of the problem. The recipient can use secret information, the decryption key, to solve the puzzle effortlessly. The RSA crypto system Some care must be taken in how a computationally difficult problem is tied to a crypto system. One of the earlier public key crypto systems, the Merkley Hellman system, linked encryption to something called the knapsack problem, which is NP complete. The problems the system generates turn out to be a special subclass of the knapsack problem that can be easily solved. So, designing public key crypto systems has its share of subtleties. Probably, the most well-known public key crypto system is also one of the oldest and is tied to the difficulty of factoring large numbers. It is named RSA after its inventors Revest, Shamir and Adelman. In this crypto system, we begin by selecting two large primes, P and Q. Let N equals P into Q 
be their product and recall that phi of n equals p minus 1 into q minus 1. Encryption and decryption keys E and D are selected so that E and phi of n are relatively prime. E into D is equivalent to 1 mod phi of n. The second condition means that D is the multiplicative inverse of E mod phi of n. The pair of values n and E form the public key while D is the private key. In practice, E is chosen either randomly or as one of the following numbers 3, 17 or 65, 537. The rules for encrypting and decrypting with RSA are simple. Let us assume for simplicity that the plain text is an integer m with m lies between 0 and n. If m is a string, we can view it as an integer by concordinating the bits of its characters. The plain text m is encrypted into ciphertext c with one modular exponentiation using the encryption key e as the exponent. c gets m power e mod n RSA encryption. The decryption of ciphertext c is also performed with an exponentiation using now the decryption key d as the exponent. m gets c power d mod n RSA decryption. The correctness of the above encryption and decryption rules is justified by the following theorem. Theorem, let p and q be two odd primes and define n equals p q. Let e be relatively prime with phi of n and let d be the multiplicative inverse of e modulo phi of n. For each integer x such that x lies between 0 and n, x power e d equivalent to x mod n. Proof, let y equals x power e d mod n. We want to prove that y equals x. Because of the way we have selected e and d, we can write e d equals k phi of n plus 1 for some integer k. Thus we have y equals x k phi of n plus 1 mod n. We distinguish two cases. Case 1, x does not divide n. We rewrite y as follows. By Euler's theorem, we have x power phi of n mod n equals 1, which implies y equals x and 1 power k mod n equals x. Case 2, x divides n. Since n equals pq with p and q primes, x is a multiple of either p or q. Suppose x is a multiple of p, that is x equals hp for some positive integer h. Clearly, x cannot be a multiple of q as well, since otherwise x would be greater than n equals pq, a contradiction. Thus, gcd of x, q equals 1 and by Euler's theorem, we have x power phi of q equivalent to 1 mod q. Since phi of n equals phi of p into phi of q, raising both sides of the above congruence to the power of k phi of q, we obtain x power k phi of n equivalent to 1 mod q, which we rewrite as x power k phi of n equals 1 plus i q for some integer i. Multiplying both sides of the above equality by x and recalling that x equals hp and n equals pq, we obtain the following result. Thus we have y equals x power k phi of n plus 1 mod n which is equals x. In either case, we have shown that y equals x which concludes the proof of the theorem using RSA for digital signatures. The symmetry of the encryption and decryption functions implies that the RSA crypto system directly supports digital signatures. Indeed, a digital signature S yes for message M is obtained by applying the decryption function to M, that is, S gets M power D mod N, RSA signature. The verification of the digital signature S yes is now performed with the encryption function that is by checking that m equivalent to 
as per the EMRN RSA verification. The difficulty of breaking RSA. Note that even if we know the value E, we cannot figure out D unless we know phi of n. Most cryptography researchers generally believe that breaking RSA requires that we compute phi of n and that this requires factoring n. While there is no proof that factorization is computationally difficult, a whole series of famous mathematicians have worked on the problem over the past few hundred years. Especially if n is large, approximately equal to 200 digits, it will take a very long time to factor it. To give you an idea of the state of the art, mathematicians were quite excited when a nationwide network of computers was able to factor the ninth Fermat number 2 power 5 12 minus 1. This number has only 155 decimal digits. Barring a major breakthrough, the RSA system will remain secure. If technology somehow advances to a point where it is feasible to factor 200 digit numbers, we need only choose an n with 3 or 400 digits. Analysis and setup for RSA encryption. The running time of RSA encryption, decryption, signature and verification is simple to analyze. Indeed, each such operation requires a constant number of modular exponentiations which can be performed with method fast exponentiation. Computational complexity Two types of complexities. One is time complexity and another one is space complexity. By time or space complexity, we mean the time or space as a function of input size required by an algorithm to solve a problem. In study of algorithms, prove by giving and analyzing an algorithm that can be solved in a big O of f of n time for some function f of n that we try to reduce as much as possible. On the other hand, in complexity theory, we try to find a function g of n as large as possible for which we prove that any algorithm solves problem on all its in big omega of g of n function. g of n is called lower bound and the complexity of the problem. The principal techniques and concepts. Information theoretic argument, adversary argument, reduction and NP completeness. Information theoretic bounds. Entropy basics. Let omega be a finite set and P a probability distribution on omega. The entropy of a random variable X distributed according to P is defined as follows. Entropy is a means to quantify the amount of uncertainty in a distribution. If the distribution is focused on a single element, the entropy is zero. For the uniform distribution on omega, the entropy is maximal at log mod omega. These examples set the bounds for the range of entropy H of X lies between 0 and log mod omega. Entropy can also be interpreted in terms of compression. Shannon's source coding theorem states that the optimal expected code word length of elements of a random variable X is the entropy of X. Make use of the conditional entropy. First consider conditioning on a single outcome as shown in below figure. This quantity can actually be larger than h of x. Imagine the case where x equals random bit if y equals 0, 0 if y equals 1. Then h of x less than 1 yet h of x given y equals 0 which is equals 1. The conditional entropy is the expectation of the last quantity over y. h of x given y equals entropy y of h x given y equals y which is less than or equals h of x. This quantity is at most the entropy of x. Finally, let the joint entropy of x comma y be h of x y equals h of x plus h of y given x. Mutual information. For lower bounds, we will use mutual information 
for two random variables z comma pi this is defined as follows in applications to communication complexity typically z will be a distribution over inputs x into y and pi will be a distribution over protocol transcripts to see how this can work to show lower bounds let us look at a warm up example the index function the index function is defined as index 0 comma 1 power n into n gives 0 comma 1 where index of x comma i equals x i consider the one way complexity of the index function from a list to bob let pi of x comma r be a random variable over the messages of alis which depends on the distribution x over alis's input and or random coins of alis notice that h of pi will be a lower bound on the maximum length of a message of alis we will actually lower bound the potentially smaller quantity i of x pi use the uniform distribution over alis's inputs then we have as follows now it remains to upper bound h of x given pi using the fact that h of y comma z equals h of y plus h of z given y we have h of x given pi less than or equal summation j h of x j given pi as we are dealing with one way communication conditioning on a particular input to bob does not change alice's action thus we have h of x j given pi equals h of x j given pi comma b equals j that is given that bob's input is actually j finally we have by correctness of the protocol that this entropy must be small at most h of epsilon if the error probability is epsilon putting everything together we have as shown below information theoretic argument this technique applies to problems involving comparisons useful definitions one way to represent working of an algorithm is a decision tree or binary rooted tree binary tree of height k has at most 2 power k leaves each interval node of the decision tree contains a test on the data each leaf or verdict contains an input conversely any such decision tree can be though of as an algorithm decision tree can also be used to analysis the complexity of a problem on the average rather than in the worst case the complexity of comparison based sorting problem 1 what is the minimum number of comparison needed to sort n items a decision tree is a labeled directed binary tree each internal node contains a comparison between two of the elements to be sorted each leaf contains an ordering of the elements given a total order relation between the elements a trip through the tree consists of starting from the root and asking one self the question that is found there if the answer is yes the trip continues recursively in the left hand subtree otherwise it continues recursively in the right hand subtree the trip ends when it reaches a leaf this leaf contains the verdict associated with the order relation used a decision tree for sorting n elements is valid if to each possible order relation between the elements it associates a verdict that is compatible with this relation finally a decision tree is pruned if all its leaves are accessible from the root by making some consistent sequence of decisions the following problem will help you grasp these notions problem 2 verify that the decision tree given in below figure is valid for sorting three elements a b and c Every valid decision tree for sorting any elements gives rise to an ad hoc sorting algorithm for the same number of elements. The following figure shows an algorithm to the above decision tree. Similarly, to every deterministic algorithm for sorting by comparison that corresponds for each value of n, a decision tree that is valid for sorting any elements. The below figure shows the tree corresponding to the insertion sorting algorithm when three elements are to be sorted. The below figure shows the tree corresponding to the heap sort algorithm when three elements are to be sorted. Notice that heap sort sometimes makes unnecessary comparisons. 
For instance, if B is less than or equals A, which is less than C, the decision tree of heap sort first tests whether B is a greater than A. Answer, no. And then, whether C is greater than A. Answer, yes. It would now be possible to establish the correct verdict. But it nonetheless asks again whether B is greater than A before reaching its conclusion. Thus, heap sort is not optimal. This situation does not occur with the decision tree of figure of insertion sort, but beware of appearances. It occurs even more frequently with the insertion sorting algorithm than with heap sort when the number of elements to be sorted increases. Problem 3. Give the pruned decision trees corresponding to the insertion sorting algorithm and to heap sort for the case of four elements. The height of the pruned decision tree corresponding to any algorithm for sorting any elements by comparison, that is, the distance from the root to the most distant leaf, gives the number of comparisons carried out by this algorithm in the worst case. For example, a possible worst case for sorting three elements by insertion is encountered if the array is already sorted into descending order. C is less than B and B is less than A. In this case, the three comparisons B less than A, C less than A and C less than B situated on the path from the root to the appropriate verdict in the decision tree all have to be made. The decision trees for sorting three elements are all of height 3. Can we find a valid decision tree for sorting three elements whose height is less? If so, we shall have an ad hoc algorithm for sorting three elements that is more efficient in the worst case. Try it. You will soon see that this cannot be done. We now prove more generally that such a tree is impossible. Lower bound theory. Lower bound is an estimate of a number of operations needed to solve a given problem. Tight lower bound. There exists an algorithm with the same efficiency as the lower bound. Examples are shown in this table. Methods of establishing lower bounds. Trivial lower bounds. Sorting. Information theoretic arguments. Decision trees. Any comparison sorting algorithm that is bubble sort. A convenient model of algorithms involving comparisons like sorting. Internal nodes represent comparisons. Leaves represent outcomes. Adversary arguments. Merging two sorted lists. It's a game between the adversary and the unknown algorithm. The adversary has the input and the algorithm asks questions to the adversary about the input. The adversary tries to make the algorithm work the hardest by adjusting the input consistently. It wins the game after the lower bound time, lower bound proven, if it is able to come up with two different inputs. Searching in a sorted list. Objective A of 1 lesser than A of 2 it goes up to A of N. Examples Comparison based search algorithms Search list by comparing target element with list elements Sequential search order N Binary search order log square N Comparison tree is shown in below figure. Let us denote D B of N be the worst case for best algorithm. D B of N equals highest of the best tree which is equal to shortest highest of trees. Each node will have N nodes. Lemma A tree of nodes and height H then H greater than or equals ceiling of log of N plus 1 minus 1. Then T B of N greater than or equals ceiling of log n plus 1 minus 1. Finding the minimum and the maximum. Let us consider the complexity of finding the largest and smallest elements. More formally, given a sequence x equals x1 up to xn of n distinct numbers, find indices i and j such that xi equals min of x and xj equals max of x.
how many comparisons do we need to solve this problem? An upper bound of 2n minus 3 is easy. Find the minimum in n minus 1 comparisons and then find the maximum of everything else in n minus 2 comparisons. Similarly, a lower bound of n minus 1 is easy since any algorithm that finds the min and the max certainly finds the max. We can improve both the upper and lower bound to ceiling of 3n by 2 minus 2. The upper bound is established by the following algorithm. Compare all ceiling of n by 2 consecutive pairs of elements x 2i minus 1 and x 2i. Put the smaller element into a set S. Put the larger element into a set L. And if n is odd, put xn into both L and S. Then find the smallest element of S and the largest element of L. The total number of comparisons is at most. Ceiling of n by 2 builds S and L. Ceiling of n by 2 minus 1 compute min S. Ceiling of n by 2 minus 1, compute max L. Ceiling of n by 2 plus, ceiling of n by 2 minus 1 plus, ceiling of n by 2 minus 1 equals, ceiling of 3 n by 2 minus 2. Sorting Decision tree for sorting 3 elements, as shown in below figure. To find the lower bound, we have to find the smallest depth of a binary tree. We have n factorial distinct permutations, n factorial leaf nodes in the binary decision tree. The balanced tree has the smallest depth which the lowest bound for sorting. Ceiling of log n factorial equals big omega of n log n. Method 1 is shown in below figure. Lower bound for sorting big omega of n log n. Method 2 using Stirling approximation as shown in below figure. Merging two sorted lists. Merge two sorted sequences A and B with lengths M and N. Binary decision tree. There are M plus N, C, N leaf nodes in the binary tree. There are M plus N, C, N ways. So the lower bound for merging, ceiling of log m plus n c n less than or equals m plus n minus 1, conventional merging. When m equals n, log of m plus n c n is shown in below. Using Stirling approximation, the log of m plus n c n approximately equal to big omega of n. NP completeness and reduction. NP completeness and reducibility. Perhaps the most compelling reason why theoretical computer scientists believe that P is not equals NP comes from the existence of the class of NP complete problems. This class has the intriguing property that if any NP complete problem can be solved in polynomial time, then every problem in NP has a polynomial time solution that is P equals NP. Despite years of study, though no polynomial time algorithm has ever been discovered for any NP complete problem, the language ham cycle is one NP complete problem. If we would decide ham cycle in polynomial time, then we would solve every problem in NP in polynomial time. In fact, if NP minus P should turn out to be non empty, we would say with certainty that ham cycle belongs to NP minus P. The NP complete languages are, in a sense, the hardest languages in NP. We shall show how to compare the relative hardness of languages using a precise notion called polynomial time reducibility. Then, we formally define the NP complete languages and we finish by sketching a proof that one such language called Circuit SAT is NP complete. Reducibility. Intuitively, a problem Q can be reduced to another problem Q dash. If any instance of Q can be easily rephrased as an instance of Q dash, the solution to 
which provides a solution to the instance of Q. For example, the problem of solving linear equations in an indeterminate x reduces to the problem of solving quadratic equations. Given an instance ax plus b equals 0, we transform it to 0x squared plus ax plus b equals 0, whose solution provides a solution to ax plus b equals 0. Thus, if a problem q reduces to another problem q dash, then q is, in a sense, no harder to solve than q dash. Returning to our formal language framework for decision problems, we say that a language L1 is polynomial time reducible to a language L2. Return L1 polynomial time reduction L2. If there exists a polynomial time computable function f, 0, 0,1 star implies 0, 0,1 star such that for all x belongs to 0, 0,1 star x belongs to L1 if and only if f of x belongs to L2. The function f is the reduction function and polynomial time algorithm f that computes f is a reduction algorithm. The following figure illustrates the idea of a polynomial time reduction from a language L1 to another language L2 via a reduction function f. For any input, x belongs to 0, 0,1 star, the question of whether x belongs to L1 has the same answer as the question of whether f of x belongs to L2. Each language is a subset of 0, 0,1 star. The reduction function f provides a polynomial time mapping such that if x belongs to L1, then f of x belongs to L2. Moreover, if x does not belong to L1, then f of x does not belong to L2. Thus, the reduction function maps any instance x of the decision problem represented by the language L1 to an instance f of x of the problem represented by L2. Providing an answer to whether f of x belongs to L2 directly provides the answer to whether x belongs to L1. Polynomial time reductions give us a powerful tool for proving that various languages belong to P. NP completeness, NPC. Polynomial time reductions provide a formal means for showing that one problem is at least as hard as another to within a polynomial time factor. That is, if L1 polynomial time reduction L2, then L1 is not more than a polynomial factor harder than L2, which is why the less than or equal to notation for reduction is mnemonic. We can now define the set of NP-complete languages, which are the hardest problems in NP. A language L is a subset of 0, 0,1 star is NP-complete if 1. L belongs to NP and 2. L dash Polynomial time reduction L for every L dash belongs to NP. If a language L satisfies property 2 but not necessarily property 1, we say that L is NP hard. Also define NPC to be the class of NP complete languages. As the following theorem shows, NP completeness is at the crux of deciding whether P is in fact equal to NP. Theorem. If any NP complete problem is polynomial time solvable, then P equals NP. Equivalently, if any problem in NP is not polynomial time solvable, then no NP complete problem is polynomial time solvable. Proof. Suppose that L belongs to P and also that L belongs to NPC. For any L dash belongs to NP, we have L dash polynomial time reduction L by property 2 of the definition of NP completeness. Thus, by lemma, which is shown in below figure, we also have that L dash belongs to P, which proves the first statement of the theorem. To prove the second statement, note that it is the contrapositive of the first statement. It is for this reason that research into the P not equals NP question centers around the NP complete problems. 
most theoretical computer scientists believe that p not equals np which leads to the relationships among p np and npc both p and npc are wholly contained within np and p intersection npc equals null lemma if l1 l2 is a subset of a set 0,1 star or languages such that l1 polynomial time reduction l2 then l2 belongs to p implies l1 belongs to p proof let a2 be a polynomial time algorithm that decides l2 and let f be a polynomial time reduction algorithm that computes the reduction function f we shall construct a polynomial time algorithm a1 that decides l1 below figure illustrates how we construct a1 the algorithm f is a reduction algorithm that computes the reduction function f from l1 to l2 in polynomial time and a2 is a polynomial time algorithm that decides l2 algorithm a1 decides whether x belongs to l1 by using f to transform any input x into f of x and then using a2 to decide whether f of x belongs to l for a given input x belongs to 0,1 star algorithm a1 uses f to transform x into f of x and then it uses a2 to test whether f of x belongs to l2 algorithm a1 takes the output from algorithm a2 and produces that answer as its own output the algorithm runs in polynomial time since both f and a2 run in polynomial time this figure shows relationships among p np and npc but for all we know someone may yet come up with a polynomial time algorithm for an np complete problem thus proving that p equals np nevertheless since no polynomial time algorithm for any np complete problem has yet been discovered a proof that a problem is np complete provides excellent evidence that it is intractable reduction Let us consider a decision problem A which we would like to solve in polynomial time. We call the input to a particular problem an instance of that problem. For example in path an instance would be a particular graph G particular vertices u and v of G and a particular integer k. Now suppose that we already know how to solve a different decision problem B in polynomial time. Finally suppose that we have a procedure that transforms any instance alpha of a into some instance beta of b with the following characteristics the transformation takes polynomial time the answers are the same that is the answer for alpha is yes if and only if the answer for beta is also yes we call such a procedure a polynomial time reduction algorithm and the below figure shows it provides us a way to solve problem a in polynomial time way to solve problem a in polynomial time given an instance alpha of problem a use the polynomial time reduction algorithm to transform it to an instance beta of problem b run the polynomial time decision algorithm for b on the instance beta use the answer for beta as the answer for alpha As long as each of these steps takes polynomial time all three together do also and so we have a way to decide on alpha in polynomial time in other words by reducing solving problem a to solving problem b we use the easiness of b to prove the easiness of a recalling that np completeness is about showing how hard a problem is rather than how easy it is we use polynomial time reductions in the opposite way to show that a problem is np complete let us take the idea a step further and show how we could use polynomial time reductions to show that no polynomial time algorithm can exist for a particular problem b suppose we have a decision problem a for which we already know that no polynomial time algorithm can exist suppose further that we have a polynomial time reduction transforming instances of a to instances of b now we can use a simple proof by contradiction to show that no polynomial time algorithm can exist for b suppose otherwise that is suppose that b has a polynomial time algorithm for np completeness we cannot assume 
that there is absolutely no polynomial time algorithm for problem A. We prove that problem B is NP complete on the assumption that problem A is also NP complete. P and NP. The class P is defined as the set of recognition problem for which there exists a polynomial time algorithm where P stands for polynomial time. Thus, P comprises those problems that are formally considered easy. Problems in class P are called tractable. Problems solvable in polynomial time, P time, are considered tractable. The larger problem, class NP contains the class P. The term NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial and refers to a different hypothetical model of computation which can solve the problems in NP in polynomial time. The class NP consists of all recognition problem with the following property. For any S instance of the problem there exists a polynomial length certificate or proof of this fact that can be verified in polynomial time. Polynomial time P time equals big O of n power k where n is the input size and k is a constant. NP complete problems have no known polynomial time solution considered intractable. A decision problem has a yes or no answer. It's different but related to optimization problem where trying to maximize or minimize the value. For example, consider the problem of determining whether an undirected graph is connected that is whether there are path between every pair of nodes in the graph. This problem's input is a graph G consisting of nodes and edges and its question is, is G connected? Notice that most optimization problems are not recognition problems but most have recognition counterparts. For example, a recognition version of the TSP has as input both a graph G with costs and the edges and a number k. The associated question is, does G contain a traveling salesman tour of length less than or equal to k? In general, an optimization problem is not much harder to solve than its recognition counterpart. One can usually embed the recognition algorithm in a binary search over the possible objective function values to solve the optimization problem with a polynomial number of calls to the embedder algorithm. In fact, by reversing the roles played by yes or no, we obtain a problem class known as co-NP. For every recognition problem in NP, there is an associated recognition problem in co-NP obtained by framing the NP question is the negative. Example, do all the traveling salesman tools in G have length greater than K. Many recognition problems are believed to lie outside both of the classes NP and CoNP because they possess no appropriate certificate. Complexity class P. P contains L, which is a subset of 0, 0,1 star, such that there exists an algorithm A that decides L in P time. Path belongs to P. Complexity class NP Let A be a P time algorithm and K is a constant. NP contains L which is belongs to 0, 0,1 star such that there exists a certificate Y. Modulus of Y equals big O of modulus of X to the power K and an algorithm A such that A of X, Y equals 1. Subset sum belongs to NP. P versus NP. NP has the ability to appreciate a solution. P has the ability to produce one. P is a subset of NP. Comparing hardness. NP complete problems are the hardest in NP. If any NP complete problem is P time solvable, then all problems in NP are P time solvable. Primality test. In primality testing, Consider the problem of finding large primes. It begins with a discussion of the density of primes. Proceed to examine a plausible but incomplete approach to primality testing and then present an effective randomized primality test due to Miller and Robin. The density of prime numbers. For many applications such as cryptography, we need to find large random primes. 
large primes are not too rare so that it is feasible to test random integers of the appropriate size until we find a prime the prime distribution function pi of n specifies the number of primes that are less than or equal to n for example pi of 10 equals 4 since there are four prime numbers less than or equal to 10 namely 2 3 5 and 7 the prime number theorem gives a useful approximation to pi of n shown in below the approximation n by ln n gives reasonably accurate estimates of pi of n even for small n for example it is of by less than 6% at n equals 10 power 9 where pi of n equals 58475334 and n by ln n which is approximately equal to 48254942 we can view the process of randomly selecting an integer n and determining whether it is prime as a bernoulli trial by the prime number theorem the probability of a success that is the probability that n is prime is approximately 1 by natural logarithm n the geometric distribution tells us how many trials we need to obtain a success the expected number of trials is approximately ln n or natural logarithm n thus we would expect to examine approximately ln n integers chosen randomly near n in order to find a prime that is of the same length as n for example we expect that finding a 1024 bit prime would require testing approximately ln 2 power 1024 is approximately equal to 710 randomly chosen 1024 bit numbers for primality consider the problem of determining whether or not large odd integer n is prime for notational convenience assume that n has the prime factorization n equals p1 power e1 p2 power e2 pr power er where r greater than or equals 1 comma p1 comma p2 it goes up to pr are the prime factors of n and e1 e2 up to er are positive integers the integer n is prime if and only if r equals 1 and e1 equals 1 one simple approach to the problem of testing for primality is trial division dividing n by each integer 2 comma 3 goes up to floor of root n it is easy to see that n is prime if and only if none of the trial devices divides n assuming that each trial division takes constant time the worst case running time is big theta of square root of n which is exponential in the length of n thus trial division works well only if n is very small or happens to have a small prime factor when it works trial division has the advantage that it not only determines whether n is prime or composite but also determines one of n's prime factors if n is composite in this section we are finding out whether a given number n is prime if n is composite we are not concerned with finding its prime factorization computing the prime factorization of a number is computationally expensive it is perhaps surprising that it is much easier to tell whether or not a given number is prime than it is to determine the prime factorization of the number if it is not prime pseudo primality testing consider a method for primality testing that almost works and in fact is good enough for many practical applications Later on, we shall present a refinement of this method that removes the small defect. Let Zn plus denote the non-zero elements of Zn. Zn plus equals 1 comma 2, it goes up to n minus 1 elements. If n is prime, then Zn plus equals Zn star. n is a base 2 pseudo prime. If n is composite and a power n minus 1 equivalent to 1 mod n. As per Fermat's theorem, if n is prime, then n satisfies equation a power n minus 1 equivalent to 1 mod n. Thus, if we can find any a belongs to Zn plus, 
such that n does not satisfy the above equation, then n is certainly composite. Surprisingly, the converse almost holds, so that this criterion forms an almost perfect test for primality. Test to see whether n satisfies the above equation a power n minus 1 is equivalent to 1 more n for a equals 2. If not, we declare n to be composite by returning composite. Otherwise, we return prime, guessing that n is prime, when in fact, all we know is that n is either prime or a base 2 pseudo prime. Following figure shows the procedure pretends in this manner to be checking the primality of n. Assume that the input n is an odd integer greater than 2. This procedure can make errors, but only of one type. That is, if it says that n is composite, then it is always correct. If it says that n is prime, however, then it makes an error only if n is a base to pseudo prime. How often does this procedure error? To make a mistake. Surprisingly rare. There are only 22 values of n less than 10,000 for which it errors. The first four such values are 341, 561, 645 and 1105. We won't prove it, but the probability that this program makes an error on a randomly chosen beta bit number goes to zero as beta implies infinity. If you are merely trying to find a large prime for some application, for all practical purposes, you almost never go wrong by choosing large numbers at random until one of them causes pseudo prime to return prime. But when the numbers being tested for primality are not randomly chosen, we need a better approach for testing primality. Cannot entirely eliminate all the errors because there exist composite integers n known as Carmichael numbers. The first three Carmichael numbers are 561, 1105 and 1729. Carmichael numbers are extremely rare. There are, for example, only 255 of them, less than 100 billion. We next show how to improve our primality test so that it won't be fooled by Carmichael numbers. The Miller Robin Randomized Primality Test The Miller Robin Primality Test overcomes the problems of the simple test pseudo prime with two modifications. It tries several randomly chosen base values instead of just one base value. While computing each modular exponentiation, it looks for a non-trivial square root of 1 modulo n during the final set of squarings. If it finds 1, it stops and returns composite. The pseudocode for the miller robin primality test follows. The input n greater than 2 is the odd number to be tested for primality and s is the number of randomly chosen base values from zn plus to be tried. The code uses an auxiliary procedure, witness, such that witness of a comma n is true if and only if a is a witness to the compositeness of n, that is, if it is possible using a to prove that n is composite. The test witness of a comma n is an extension of but more effective than the test a power n minus 1 not equivalent to 1 mod n that formed the basis using a equals to for pseudo prime. We first present and justify the construction of witness and then we shall show how we use it in the miller robin primality test. Let n minus 1 equals 2 power t u where t is greater than or equals 1 and u is odd. That is, the binary representation of n1 is the binary representation of odd integer u followed by exactly t zeros. Therefore, a power n minus 1 is equivalent to a power u the whole power 2t into mod n so that we can compute a power n minus 1 mod n by first computing a power u mod n and then squaring the result t times successively. The following figure shows the pseudocode for 
witness of a comma n to compute a power n minus one mod n. This pseudocode for witness computes a power n minus one mod n by first computing the value x not equals a power u mod n in line two and then squaring the result t times in a row in the for loop of lines three to six. By induction on i. The sequence x not it goes up to x t of values computed satisfies the equation x i is equivalent to a power two i into u mod n for i equals zero to t so that in particular x t equivalent to a power n minus one mod n. After line four performs a squaring step, however, the loop may terminate early if lines five to six detect that a non-trivial square root of one has just been discovered. If so, the algorithm stops and returns true. Lines seven to eight return true if the value computed for x t equivalent to a power n minus one mod n is not equal to one, just as the pseudo prime procedure returns composite in this case. Line nine returns false if we have not returned true in line six or eight. If witness of a comma n returns true, then we can construct a proof that n is composite. Using a as a witness, if witness returns true from line eight, then it has discovered that x t equals a power n minus one mod n, not equals one. By Fermat's theorem, if n is prime, that a power n minus one equivalent to one mod n for all a belongs to z n plus. Therefore, n cannot be prime, and the equation a power n minus one mod n, not equals one. Proves this fact. If witness returns true from line six, then it has discovered that x i minus one is a non-trivial square root of one modulo n. Since we have that x i minus one not equivalent to plus or minus one mod n, yet x i not equivalent to x i minus one square is equivalent to one mod n. If find that. The call witness of a comma n returns true, then n is surely composite, and the witness a, along with the reason that the procedure returns true, provides a proof that n is composite. At this point, we present an alternative description of the behavior of witness as a function of the sequence x equals x not up to x t, which we shall find useful later on. When we analyze the efficiency of the Miller-Robin primality test, note that if x i equals one for some zero less than or equals i, which is less than t, witness might not compute the rest of the sequence. If it were to do so, each value x i plus one, x i plus two, it goes up to x t, would be one, and we consider these positions in the sequence x as being all ones. Four cases. Case one, x equals the sequence goes up to d, where d not equals one. The sequence x does not end in one. Written true in line eight, a is a witness to the compositeness of n by Fermat's theorem. Case two, x equals one. It goes up to one. The sequence x is all ones. Written false. A is not a witness to the compositeness of n. Case three, x has the elements minus one and the sequence goes up to one. The sequence x ends in one and the last non-one is equal to one. Written false. A is not a witness to the compositeness of n. Case four, x contains the sequence goes up to one, where d is not equals plus or minus one. The sequence x ends in one, but the last non-one. Is not one written true in line six. A is a witness to the compositeness of n, since d is a non-trivial square root of one. Examine the Miller-Robin primality test based on the use of witness. Again, we assume that n is an odd integer greater than two. The procedure Miller-Robin shown in below figure is a probabilistic search for a proof that n is composite. The main loop beginning on line one. Picks up to yes, random values of a from z n plus line two. If one of the a's picked is a witness to the compositeness of n, 
Then Miller Robin returns composite on line 4. Such a result is always correct by the correctness of witness. If the Miller Robin finds no witness in S trials, then the procedure assumes that this is because no witnesses exist and therefore it assumes that N is prime. We shall see that this result is likely to be correct if S is large enough, but that there is still a tiny chance that the procedure may be unlucky in its choice of A's and that witnesses do exist even though none has been found. To illustrate the operation of Miller-Robin, let N be the Carmichael number 561 so that N minus 1 equals 560 is equals 2 power 4 into 35, T equals 4 and U equals 35. If the procedure chooses A equals 7 as a base, Witness computes x0 equivalent to a power 35 which is equivalent to 241 mod 561 and thus computes the sequence x equals 241 comma 298 comma 166 comma 67 and 1. Thus, witness discovers a non-trivial square root of 1 in the last squaring step since a power 280 equivalent to 67 mod n and a power 560 equivalent to 1 mod n. Therefore, a equals 7 is a witness to the compositeness of n. Witness of 7 comma n returns true and Miller-Robin returns composite. If n is a beta bit number, Miller-Robin requires big O of s beta arithmetic operations and big O of s beta cube bit operations. Since it requires asymptotically no more work than S modular exponentiations. Quadratic residues. Given a number A such that GCD of A comma P equals 1. A is called a quadratic residue if X square equals A mod P has a solution, otherwise it is called a quadratic non residue. The problem of finding out whether a number is a quadratic residue or not. Problem of finding square roots modulo p is hard and we still don't have any efficient solution for it. Before we start proving properties of quadratic residues and non-residues, let us introduce a notation shown in below figure. In above notation, a by p is known as the legendary symbol of a modulo p. The legendary symbol is a number theoretic function a by p which is defined to be equal to plus or minus 1 depending on whether a is a quadratic residue modulo p. We are interested in finding out when it is 1 and when it is minus 1. The following theorem gives a very simple criteria to check whether a number is a quadratic residue or not. Theorem 1 A number a with gcd of a comma p equals 1 where p is an odd prime satisfies as shown in below. Note 1. a power p minus 1 equals 1 by Fermat's theorem. So, a power p minus 1 by 2 is a square root of 1 modulo p. There are only 2 square roots of 1 modulo p, 1 and minus 1. Proof. If a is a quadratic residue, then there exists an x such that x square equals a mod p. Taking power 1 equals x power p minus 1 which is equals a power p minus 1 by 2 mod p equals a by p. Hence one direction is easy. For the other direction, if a is a quadratic non-residue. Problem. For every 1 which is less than or equals s, less than or equals p minus 1, there exists a unique t, s t equals a mod p. Clearly s not equals t. Otherwise, A will become a residue. This implies that the numbers 1 up to P-1 can be divided into P-1 by 2 pairs such that every pair multiplies to A modulo P. Taking the multiplication over all elements between 1 and P-1 as shown in below. Using Wilson's theorem, if A is a quadratic non-residue, then A power P-1 by 2 equals minus 1 mod p, which is equals a by p. Theorem 2. For two numbers, a and b, both q 
को प्राइम टू एन और प्राइम पी अशोन इन बिलो दिस इज नोन एज द मल्टीप्लीकेटिविटी ऑफ लेजेंडरी सिंबल क्वारेडिक रेसिप्रोसिटी बिकॉज ऑफ मल्टीप्लीकेटिविटी ऑफ लेजेंडरी सिंबल इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू फाइंड क्यू बाई पी वेर क्यू इज अ प्राइम दिस इज ए हॉर्ड क्वेश्चन वी डोंट नो द एंसर टू इट इट चिल ये ब्यूटिफुल थियर बाई गॉस कॉल्ड क्वारेडिक रेसिप्रोसिटी gives the relation between p by q and q by p the first step is to prove gauss's lemma lemma 1 suppose the number of elements in set s greater than p by 2 is l where s equals a it goes up to p minus 1 by 2 into a every number in s is considered modulo p then a by p equals minus 1 power l proof remember that the set A comma two A, it goes up to p minus one into A is a permutation of elements one comma two up to p minus one. If we consider the first half of this set, yes, it is shown here. This is almost the permutation of elements. Say R one up to R k be the elements in S less than p by two, and S one up to S l. be the elements greater than p by 2 then the set has all elements between 1 and p minus 1 by 2 s dash equals r1 up to rk comma p minus s1 up to p minus sl problem show that no two elements are the same in set s dash so the set s dash is just a permutation of 1 up to p minus 1 by 2 elements Multiplying all elements in S dash modulo p is shown in below. Notice that R i dash into S and S i dash into S make up a set S, which is shown below. This proves that a by p equals a power p minus one by two, which is equals minus one power l mod p. This lemma will help us in proving another characterization of legendary symbol. Theorem for an odd a co prime to an odd prime p is shown in below figure. Problem two. What will be the corresponding theorem when a is even? Now we are ready to prove the celebrated quadratic reciprocity theorem. Theorem four for two odd primes p and q are shown in below figure. Conclusion. In this chapter we have covered the following in detail information theoretic argument adversary argument p and np np completeness and reduction primality tests quadratic residues applications to cryptography lower bound theory and information theoretic bounds